Hello students, this is the week one lecture for MAT 120 Elementary Statistics. We're going to be talking about sampling from the population and collecting data. We're going to talk about different types of sampling techniques. We're going to talk about why we collect data in the form of a sample and what we can learn from a population based on the sample. What uh, numbers we can generate from the sample called statistics and what we can do to use those statistics to generalize or make a prediction about what's going on in the population in the parameter. Anyway, that's a lot of vocabulary words, so let's get started. Uh, we're going to be talking about how we collect information, and let's springboard directly into what is statistics. Statistics is the collection of methods for planning experiments, obtaining data, and then organizing, summarizing, analyzing, interpreting, presenting, and drawing conclusions based on that data. It seems like a lot, but you're going to be doing all of these things in class this year, uh, this semester, I should say. Organizing means getting them all together and displaying them in a way that makes sense to the viewer. Summarizing means sometimes you have to take all the numbers and either take an average or uh, like find the middle of the data, that kind of thing. Analyzing means taking a look at the data and trying to find some sort of uh, trend or uh, applying some sort of formula to them. Uh, interpreting means trying to take that information and make some sort of judgment uh, about the data itself. Presenting, again, we were talking about a little bit before. Presenting that data, I ran out of different colors for my highlighter, so I'll just underline this. Presenting the data just means putting it into a, a way that uh, somebody can understand it, not just looking at the raw data, but looking at the summary data. And then finally, drawing conclusions based on that data. Drawing conclusions is probably the most important part. We're going to save that till about the end of the course. So you can think about statistics as the study of data, and something that I like to say to my students in class is that statistics is the least mathy math class. Um, of course, we have plenty of formulas. You have formulas for z-scores. You have formulas for uh, finding a confidence interval or completing a significance test. You also have formulas for stuff like uh, finding the linear regression equation. However, most of these formulas you do in your calculator the most important part of statistics is being able to present and draw conclusions. Um, organizing, summarizing, analyzing, and interpreting is really, uh, you know, the, the nuts and bolts, but presenting and drawing conclusions is, uh, is what separates a statistician from just a mathematician. Um, there, these, uh, this field, statistics, allows us to help answer questions in many other fields, like ecology, health, environmental sciences. As you can imagine, if you want to be in any of these fields, you need to be able to uh, analyze and interpret the numbers that you collect. If you're an ecologist, you might be collecting information on how many animals of a given species live in a particular area. Once you collect that information, you have to display it somehow, make a graph or a chart, and then go announce to, let's say, the, uh, the, the folks that run the outer, outdoor spaces in this area, listen, the deer population is getting higher and higher and higher. It may be a good idea for us to put some fencing around the community garden. Um, health, uh, obviously I'm recording this in the year 2021, uh, we're in the sort of tail end of the pandemic, hopefully, but um, it is definitely something that we look at every day, statistics for uh, different diseases. And for environmental sciences, uh, something that will probably come up more and more as, as uh, the environment changes more and more, uh, weather forecasting and predicting extreme environmental patterns is made easier by statistics, collecting data and analyzing that data. In statistics, we're going to be learning about a bunch of different uh, uh, concepts. First, we're going to look at designing data collection. Uh, at the beginning of this class, I did a data collection on you, which was asking you to complete a, a survey. You could also uh, do observational um, data collection, and there are a couple other types as well. Preparing and analyzing that data, in other words, taking that data and uh, cleaning it up. Like, once you collect it, it's all raw data. If I collected everybody's shoe size in the room, it would all be just a list of numbers. But then if I were to find the average or if I were to display it in a uh, dot plot or something like that, that's really preparing and analyzing that data. And then reporting conclusions. We can come to conclusions based on how likely we think uh, the, the uh, situation is that we found. Uh, like if I collected information from everybody in the room and I found the average shoe size was maybe 13 or 14, my conclusion might be the people in this room are probably basketball players or somebody that, uh, that is uh, more likely to have a larger shoe size because that's not really the average shoe size of the average person in the United States. And then inference learning from the data. Uh, you know that uh, data is collected from uh, samples, which means that it could be fairly random what, uh, what information you get. So keeping that in mind, 
uh, what, what can we learn from the data? What really can we uh, realistically uh, learn about the population by looking at a set of data? The first difference that I want to talk about is between population and sample. When I talk about the population, I talk about everybody that I'm concerned about. If I'm designing a study and I'm trying to figure out the effects of a uh, certain, you know, uh, test prep procedure on uh, high school students, my population would be all high school students. But of course, I wouldn't be able to give that test prep course to every single high school student because I don't have the money for that, I don't have the time for that, and frankly, I don't have the inclination for that. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to pick a sample. I'm not going to look at all high school students in history, in the world. I'm going to pick all the high school students that I uh, have available to me or ones that I can randomly select, preferably randomly select. In statistics, we generally want to study a population. The population is all of the things under study, whereas we study a population by selecting a sample, just a small subsection of that population. And piggybacking on population and uh, sample is parameters and statistics. Now parameter, which has the letter P in it, is a number that is descriptive measurement of the population, which has the letter P in it. And then statistic, which has the letter S in it, is a number that's learned, a statistic, not statistics, come on, Mr. Scorning, is a number that's learned, observed, or computed from a sample, that's an S. So P parameter, P population, S statistic, S sample. You collect data from a sample to make a statistic in order to make a judgment or a prediction about a parameter that describes a population. And the question here is typically a parameter is unknown. Why is that? Well, it turns out that most of the time parameters are unknown because statisticians or researchers or uh, people that are interested don't have the resources to collect data on everybody in the population. So they collect a limited number and they use that to make a generalization about or a prediction about what's going on in the population. So here's some examples of parameters and statistics. An example of a population parameter, a parameter uh, for the proportion. 39% uh, of all Stony Brook University students were over age 25. I'm using SBU because I graduated from SBU in 2008. Go Seawolves. Um, parameter is a number that describes a population. So uh, a, a parameter for proportion, 39% of all Stony Brook University students were over age 25. I'm talking about all the Stony Brook University students. Uh, yet again, we're talking about uh, different types of parameters. An average or a mean is another type of parameter. It's a number that describes an entire population. In a recent quarter, the average age of all SBU students was 27.1 years. So 27.1 years is a parameter. It is specifically the population mean. And then last but not least, median uh, is, another, uh, is another parameter that we could collect about the population. Half of all Stony Brook University students were 22 years old or younger, so 22 would be the median there. So again, all of this is numerical information that is about a population. Whereas um, a statistic is all about a sample. Uh, for proportions, 41% of a sample of 200 students were over age 25. If it's just a sample, it's not the whole population, which means we're talking about statistics here. Same thing with average, average or mean, uh, the average age of a random sample, another sample here, uh, is 28.3 years. There we go. That sample means that we're dealing not with a population average or mean, but a statistic, which is the sample average or mean. And last but not least, we got median here. And a sample, I mean, I'm not going to belabor the point. Sample means we're talking about a statistic, right? S for sample, P for uh, parameter, uh, S for statistic, P for population. All right, moving along. Let's talk about visualizing parameters and statistics. So we wanna know about these. This is a population of, looks like voodoo dolls, whatever it is. This is a population of individuals. And of this population, we wanna know, let's say for argument's sake, the population mean, which is the average, let's say uh, the average weight of all of these uh, different strange little dolls. We're not gonna weigh every single doll, that would be lunacy. So what we're going to do is we're going to randomly select a smaller sample, find the sample mean, and then use that to make an estimate or an inference, a guess, about the population mean. Because we don't know the population mean, but we do know what's going on in the sample. Uh, the first type of symbols that you're gonna learn about in this class are these symbols. This is called X bar, or if you were in my uh, statistics class in Stony Brook University, you would have heard the professor who is from Boston say X bar. 
x ba or x bar is the sample mean. It's the mean of the sample. Whereas the mu, with, this is a Greek letter mu, uh, the mu is the parameter. Mu stands for the population mean. So x bar is for statistics, mu is for parameters. All right, the discussion questions uh, we will discuss in lecture, not necessary for you to do here, uh, but it's a good idea to maybe pause the video and uh, contemplate these for a moment before you move on. All right, take a look at variables and data. Variables are the description in words of the characteristic of interest. So for example, a vari variable could be the shoe size of every person in this room, right? I described it in words. I didn't say any numbers. I said, I wanna know the shoe size of every person in this room. That means I described it in words, didn't I? I did a pretty good job, used all the good words. But data is the numerical information, or I should say data are, yes, data is plural, the numerical information collected about this variable for individuals in the population or sample. So if my, my variable is the shoe size of everybody in this room, my data would be the numerical numbers, numerical numbers, good one, uh, the numbers of all of the people's shoe sizes, like 15, or 10, or nine and a half, or 4W, or whatever the case may be. Like all of these are their shoe sizes. So keep in mind a variable will be a description, not a number. A variable is going to be a description in a phrase, which is words, whereas, oh, I guess that should be in blue, description in a phrase, uh, whereas for data, it is information collected, it's numerical information, so it's going to take the form of numbers, right? All right. Here's some examples. Suppose we are studying the commutes of LaGuardia students. I am an adjunct professor at LaGuardia uh, Community College in Long Island City, New York, uh, from to school from home. So the population is who we are talking about, who we're concerned about. The population isn't uh, you know, driving or taking the train or whatever. The population is LaGuardia students, right? Those are the folks that we're concerned about. These are the people that we're figuring out what their, uh, their commute type is. What's one possible example of a sample? Well, I guess that would be you if you're listening to this video. Because if you're listening to this video, more than likely you're one of my students in my LaGuardia Community College uh, MAT 120 Elementary Statistics class. So a sample would be your class, right? Uh, or it could be any other class in LaGuardia. Or it could be all freshmen at LaGuardia. Something like that. That would be a sample, which is not every LaGuardia student, but some LaGuardia students in a smaller group. Uh, so a sample would be a smaller group, a smaller subset, a little mathematics word for you, of LaGuardia students. Some examples of variables and data, well, a variable could be, how does a LaGuardia student commute to school? So that is a definition in, that's right, words. And the data could be, well, the answers to that, right? Car, car, bus, walk, car, bike, car, right. Anything like that, those are uh, sometimes, most often numerical, but in this case it is not numerical. We'll talk about what that means in a moment. But it's just the data that answers the variable, answers the question. And secondly here, a variable could be distance that a student commutes. Uh, so that would be the words, the sentence. Uh, that is essentially the question, how long do you commute? And the data is the answer. Oh, I commute uh, two and a half miles. I commute uh, 8.4 miles. This person comes in from oh, I don't know, comes in from Connecticut somewhere, right? That's the, uh, that's the main idea. It's an answer to the question. So these are uh, all examples of variables and data. Moving on to slide number seven. Uh, I guess this is slide number 13. Uh, data types, quantitative data. Remember when I said that uh, most of the time the data is going to take a numerical value? Well, it makes sense that in statistics we're going to be working with numerical values because you can't add and subtract vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry, right? You can't find the average of those two things, uh, of those three things. However, with quantitative data, which is data that consists of numbers, right? That stuff you can add, subtract, multiply, divide, and all that happy stuff. And in the subset of quantitative data, there's two main types of quantitative data. There's discrete data, which is data that um, has possible values that are finite, right? When I talk about shoe size, you either wear a size 12, a size 12 and a half, or a size 13. You don't wear a size 12.375. I don't think they make that. And even if they do, it would be a weird size and maybe they only did it custom sized for you. But continuous data is a little bit different. Continuous data um, could be from infinitely many possible values. So an example of that might be, um, you know, what's your weight? 
Well, most of the time people say, oh, you know, I'm 150 pounds, I'm 160 pounds. But realistically, if they stepped on an accurate enough scale, they would get 162.6 pounds or 195.282 pounds. Like it could be measured to a very, very uh, careful degree. It could be measured to as many decimal points as you want. So that's why I call that continuous data because the data's values or decimals could continue. All right, so those are the two types of quantitative data. And here are some examples. These are quantitative data values. Uh, let me scroll it so you can see everything here. Number of eggs in a basket, kids in a class, Facebook likes. One thing I like to say about discrete values is that discrete values can't really be cut in half very easily or subdivided very easily. So here's an example, number of eggs in a basket. I wouldn't ever say, oh, I have six and a half eggs in a basket because if I had six and a half, <laughs> if I had six and a half eggs in a basket, I'd really have six eggs in the basket and one broken egg, right? I can't say that I can cut eggs or kids or likes or diaper changes in half. Whereas um, the weight difference to eight decimals before and after a cookie binge, if I eat a bunch of cookies and I weigh myself before and afterwards, I'm probably going to have a different weight and it can be subdivided into different decimals. Wind speed, I can measure it to 158 miles per hour, 158.5 miles per hour, 158.25 miles an hour water temperature, volts of electricity, basically anything that you can measure on a, on a, like a ruler or a continuous scale, we call it continuous. Moving right along to qualitative data. If you remember, one of the other questions was about commutes uh, to LaGuardia Community College, and the commute time to LaGuardia Community College was quantitative, but the commute type, whether it's cars or bikes or whatever, is a qualitative uh, piece of information, it's qualitative data. It's also called categorical or rarely attribute data, but categorical and qualitative are basically what you're going to be hearing. It just talks about data that is non-numeric or specifically sometimes it's a number, but that number can be compared. So let's talk about um, the non-numeric characteristics. Uh, names, labels, or categories, uh, you know, like small, medium, and large. Those are nominal data. Actually, that's ordinal data, sorry. Uh, nominal data is like vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. Uh, another nominal data could be uh, your your blood type or something like that, where it's data about you, but I can't say that blood type A is better than or before blood type B or better than blood type O, whatever. However, ordinal data can still be arranged in some sort of order. We just talked about nominal data. Let's talk about ordinal data. Some so sort of order, like small, medium, and large, or freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, that kind of thing. But that's still ordinal data. So here's some examples of discrete data. Uh, discrete data would be number of new cases of breast cancer reported yearly from these two years. It makes sense that the number of cases can't be subdivided into half a case. Number of cows in a field, number of students in the room, those are discrete data examples. Continuous data examples might be temperature in this room. It could be subdivided by decimals. You could get really accurate or not as accurate, but that, that tells you that it's continuous. The age of people riding the E-Train, I know that most of the time people just say, I'm 12 or whatever, but you're really 12 and like 10 months and like six days and like four hours, you can keep subdividing it. So age is a continuous uh, piece of data. Weight in pounds of the last 10 shipments of fruit, you get the idea. If you can measure it to any degree of accuracy, like two or three or four decimal places, we call it continuous. So for nominal data examples, favorite color is a good nominal um data example because i can't really say that green is better than purple is better than red or whatever the brands of cars i can't say that uh toyota honda subaru ferrari are better or less than um or better or worse than anything else and then feelings i can't rate feelings sad happy mad etc whereas ordinal data examples a b c d f those are uh letters for grades and even though sometimes there are numbers associated with them a, B, C, D, F themselves are just uh, uh, ordinal data. Shirt size, which is small, medium, large. Speed, which is slow, average, fast. That kind of thing. There are some special instances in which... Uh, let me go back for a second. There are some special instances in which qualitative data could be numerical in form, but still considered qualitative. For example, zip codes, phone numbers, OSIS numbers, ID numbers, right? All of these are numerical, right? Your zip code, uh, the zip code for the school is 11375 for Queens Metro, uh, but that doesn't mean it's better than 11374, right? Your phone number, if it's, you know, 555-1234, it's not better than 555 
You can't compare them as far as higher or smaller. You can't compare them exactly like that. Same thing with OSIS numbers. Uh, it's not assigned in any particular order. So um, we call that qualitative data, even though these take the form of numbers, because we can't compare them in terms of larger, uh, larger or small. All right, we already did that. So let's move on to data gathering. There are many different ways to gather data, such as census. When you collect data from every member of the population, it happens every 10 years. It just happened uh, last year in 2020. Sampling is collecting data from a smaller subset. Uh, this happens most often, I would say, and it's usually collected using a random method. Um, in other words, we don't choose all of the people that are in front of us. We try to randomize it so that, you know, we get uh, a good representation of the population. More on that later. An observational study is uh, collecting data with no control over possible affecting factors. You might sit at the corner, the intersection of like Metropolitan Avenue and Woodhaven Boulevard and look for the colors of cars. One of my st students from a couple of years ago did that. But that is an observational study because you have no control over, you know, what time of day it is or whether more people in Middle Village buy red cars than yellow cars or whatever. Like that's that's the idea of an observational study. It's not random, uh, not truly random. It's not randomly selected. It's observational. It just happens to be whoever is passing by that particular intersection. And then a design experiment is more like, I want to know what uh, what number or what like number of assignments for homework you have or students at Queens Metropolitan have. So I'll randomly select 10 Queens Metro students and ask them, how many minutes of homework did you have last night? So that's more like a designed experiment. A better example of a designed experiment actually would be where you have some control over the factors. So for example, I want to test the efficacy of a type of fertilizer, right? Uh, see how good the fertilizer does in making the plants grow. So I'm going to set up a couple of plant pots and I'm going to have uh, some fertilizer going to the first one and a large amount of fertilizer going to the second one and then no fertilizer goes into the third one. I'm controlling a, a factor of the experiment. If I'm controlling a factor of the experiment, that means I'm doing experimental studies. So again, observational versus design experiment, observational versus experimental. Observational, you got no control of what's going on, and experimental, you do have some sort of control. All right, in a New York Times article about hormone therapy for women, HRT uh, sometimes it's called, a uh, reporter writes that researchers say observational studies painted a falsely rose picture of hormone replacement because women who opt for treatments are healthier and have better habits to begin with than the women who do not. In an observational study, you wouldn't have any way of controlling for uh, whether the women um, were healthier or not, or whether they had better habits to begin with or not. So in order to really test whether um, hormone therapy for women is appropriate, then what you could do is, I'm going to separate all the women into groups. Uh, some of the women are more healthy, some of the women are less healthy. And uh, I might separate them into whether they have good habits or bad habits to begin with. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they were talking about in this uh, New York Times article about good or bad habits, but let's roll with it for a second. And then what we could do is um, try to figure out whether the women uh, have a, you know, a, a better health outcome when they take the hormone replacement as opposed to whether they don't, right? So if it's a designed experiment, you have control over who is going into the experiment and what is being experimented upon. An observational study like uh, this is more like you don't have any way of controlling for uh, any confounding factors. For designed experiments, there are a lot of different vocabulary words. Maybe you picked up on this. The first couple of lectures are going to be pretty vocabulary heavy, so it's a good idea for you to have your index cards handy. I'll just be ready to copy down a bunch of different words. Treatments are different values or components of the explanatory variable applied in an experiment. So the fertilizer would be a treatment, something that you input into the experiment to see what it affects uh, for the respondents. In our ongoing example of uh, fertilizer for plants, the response variable would be the height of the plants, right? How tall the plants get based on how much treatment you provide. A control group would be uh, probably a plant that has no fertilizer in it, right? You know this from science class. A control group is where you don't uh, give a treatment to them. Sometimes you give an inactive treatment or sometimes you just water it if it's a plant rather than giving it treatment. Placebo is an inactive treatment that has no effect on the explanatory variable. So placebo might be like, okay, I'm going to uh, come up with a pill that, you know, cures baldness. Uh, but I want to make sure that 
the act of taking a pill doesn't make the subject feel like they're getting the right treatment and, and have a psychosomatic effect, have an effect that's in their mind. So I develop a pill for, the, for my drug, but I also develop a sugar pill or a blank pill, or sometimes they call it a bread pill, um, with no drug in it whatsoever. And I say, okay, I'm gonna separate them into two groups. Some of my respondents are gonna get the drug, some of the respondents are gonna get this bread pill or sugar pill or pill that doesn't have um, any active effect on the explanatory variable. That way, everything stays the same between the control group and a placebo. Blinding is not something that uh, can be describing a, a very bright, a bright light. Blinding is when we don't tell subjects whether they're receiving the drug or a placebo, right? You saw this uh, with COVID-19 vaccine treatments. Uh, often uh, people would enroll in the studies to try to figure out whether, you know, the Pfizer, the Moderna vaccine would be more effective, but they weren't told whether they got the Pfizer vaccine or a placebo, just a fake vaccine. I think they, they used uh, maybe like saline solution or something like that. But anyway, the idea was that they either injected a drug into you or they injected a, uh, you know, a fake placebo. And then they figured out, well, did the people who had the placebo um, get better at, you know, different rates than the, uh, than the drug rates? And it turned out that, yes, they did. Uh, people who got the drug uh, more likely than not got better from the disease. And then finally, double blinding means not only do the participants not know what they're getting, but the researchers don't know what they're giving. Now, keep in mind, it's still safe because you treat all of the injections or all of the pills the same way. But it makes it so that the researchers can't give information to the participants about what they're getting. They can't say, oh, man, I know I'm giving this patient the, uh, the fake treatment, the placebo. Good luck. And then, you know, of course, the, the person can uh, use their intuition to say, oh, my gosh, why did they say it like that? They probably didn't give me the real stuff. Whereas, uh, you know, they could see a very sick patient and say, maybe we'll give the sick patient this drug, which we think is going to help. You know, that, that might cause your study to, uh, you know, to not be as fair and unbiased as it could be. In an observational study, there's something called confounding, which means when the effects of variables are mixed, such that individual effects are indeterminable. Here's a really good example of that. So I know that uh, in the summertime, in June, July, and August, it starts getting hotter. And I also know that in the summertime, uh, more people go to the local pool, right? The, the community city pool. And I also know that in the summertime, uh, more people tend to get ice cream. The ice cream uh, uh, vendors are out in full effect. But... I can't say that going to the pool more often causes more ice cream to be sold, right? I can't say that those two variables cause each other because they're actually both caused by another third variable, the fact that it's getting hot out, right? The being hot out means that more people go to the pool. Being hot, more hot out means that or causes more people to get ice cream. So a confounding variable is a variable that is not what you think is causing the effect, but it's causing the effect anyway, right? In this case, the confounding variable would be the fact that it's hot out, right? And the other variables which you might think cause each other, uh, going to the pool versus uh, getting ice cream, those two things don't cause each other. They're both caused by something else. Another example, if only the people in a particular age group are given a particular drug, the drug might look effective. For example, it used to be that when people tested uh, vaccines, they only tested them in white men between the ages of 18 and 45, right? So it may be that the drug is effective if, if it's effective in that age group and, and uh, you know, um, uh, demographic group. However, it might also be that the drug is really, really effective for males, but not effective for females, right? The confounding variable comes in when you can't tell whether it's the fact that the people are male or the fact that the drug is better, you know? So when we design experiments to co avoid confounding variables, here's an important distinction. When we design an experiment to avoid confounding variables, we want to design the experiment so that the two groups, group one and group two, for example, are as similar to each other as possible and that they represent the population at large as best they can. So group A and group B should probably be a, a pretty good facsimile or 
smaller version of the population in general. They shouldn't be biased towards having one group for, or another group, right? They should look like the population. All right, moving on up to the next slide. Here are some other problems with data gathering. Sometimes when we collect data that we think are going to be useful, the data aren't very useful. And here are some reasons why. Uh, a sample should always be representative of the population. If it's not representative of, of the population, that sample is going to be considered biased. There are a number of different ways that bias is used in statistics, but yeah, a sample that's not representative of the population is called biased. So there are a couple of different types of bias. Non-response bias or refusal bias um, is important because let's say I'm asking people, oh, you know, um, how long did it take you to do your homework yesterday? Non-response bias might take over when a student comes in and says, well, I didn't do my homework at all yesterday. That means that that person is less likely to say how long they took on their homework, which means I'm only going to get information from the folks that did do their homework. I'm not going to get accurate information on everybody who did their homework or didn't. So I won't know um, my real actual value. My sample will be biased, right? Sample size issues as well. Um, if I'm looking to figure out, you know, the maybe the average IQ of a group of students, and I only ask one student, and the student happens to have 165 IQ, I'm going to say, wow, my population's got a really super high IQ. Of course, the problem with that is the sample size is too small. I've only asked one student. Uh, a major theme running through statistics is you need to make sure that your sample size is as large as possible. Uh, collecting data or asking questions in a way that influences the response. So if I say to you, uh, what do you think that we should do about uh, making a football field at Queens Metropolitan High School? That's just a question. You could answer it any way you want. If I ask it like this, you know, football has the potential to, uh, to really draw new students to the school, uh, ones that are really academically and athletically minded. So do you think we should have a football field? See how that question was a little different? I led the answer. I, I instilled in you the idea that I probably want you to say, yes, we want a football stadium. Anyway, uh, this doesn't say casualty. This says causality. Causality has cause inside of it, which means um, something is caused by something else. A relationship between two variables does not necessarily imply that one causes the other, just like ice cream consumption and uh, pool visitations. Those two things don't cause each other. They just happen to happen at the same time because a third variable, that some other variable, heat, happened uh, at the same time. Self-funded or self-interest studies. Uh, it turns out that the, uh, the Nabisco Corporation finds that cookies are good for you. I'm sure you see the problem with that. And then, oh, uh, this video was not sponsored in any way by Nabisco. And then misleading use of data. If I uh, label a graph improperly, or I don't give you all of the data, or if I don't give you the context of the information, these are all ways in which you could uh, collect data in a problematic way. All right, I'm going to skip down a little bit to sampling methods. All of these sampling methods are methods that you need to know before you uh, go off into the world. The first type is called a simple random sample. That's the gold standard. Simple random sample means every uh, individual in the population has the same chance of being chosen. Everyone gets a number and I randomly pick 10 numbers, right? Simple random sample, done. I might uh, put all of the OSIS numbers uh, on pieces of paper and then put them all into a hat and then pick out OSIS numbers, uh, which means every child has a equal chance of being chosen. Systematic sampling is randomly selecting every case individual. Uh, and, you know, that K could be anything, every fifth individual, every seventh individual. If you stand by the main entrance of Queens Metro and say, all right, I'm going to pick every 10th student that walks through the door, that's one way of systematically sampling. It's not as random as simple random sample, but it's uh, pretty random. Convenience sampling is the one that is no good. So remember that convenience sampling isn't an ideal one. Convenient sampling is no good because it's not very random. I'm just going to pick all the people that are right in front of me. But all the people that are right in front of me might be in the same place at the same time for a reason. Like, uh, they might all be scheduled for my class. Or, you know, they might be on the first floor at this certain time because all freshmen have gym during this time, right? So convenient sampling isn't as good as simple random sampling or other types of sampling. Stratified sampling is when you create strata. Strata are groups within the population and then you pick from them. So if I want an equal number of uh, boys and girls in my 
sample. I'm going to split the groups into boys and girls and then pick an equal number of boys and equal number of girls from those groups. And then cluster sampling would be like if I went to a randomly selected classroom in Queens Metro and selected every student in that classroom. So dividing the population into clusters, in this case class uh, classrooms are clusters. I remember CL cluster, CL classroom, right? And then randomly selecting those clusters and choosing all the individuals from those clusters. Here are some examples of data. You can pause the video to take a look at these, uh, these boxes. They're just a pictorial uh, representation, pictorial representation, I should say, of how sampling works. Simple random sampling, stratified sampling, cluster sampling, and systematic sampling. Uh, here are a couple of examples that we'll talk about in the lecture. But I do want to leave you with a word of caution. This is the end of our lecture for week one. If you collect data using an inappropriate method, the data might be useless. In this case, the Campbell's Soup Company is baffled at the negative ratings for their extra chickeny chicken noodle soup. But that might be because their sample isn't representative of the population that's actually going to be eating the soup. All right. Uh, this was a video on week one, sampling from a population collecting data. Good luck studying.